They call you overgrown infants way somewhere and build them a home, a little place of their own, a French memorial home for a king. With the departure of Richard Wright. Pink Floyd began the 80s as a three-piece, with Roger Waters as the real power in the band. This disproportionate split of control was evident in the next album, The Final Cut, released back in March 1983. The overriding impression from this ill-favoured outing is one of a Roger Waters solo album. As a composer-writer, I think Rick Wright was very important. And I think Rick Wright actually did keep the spirit of Sid alive. But all the songs that uh, you go through the albums and check out the song, apart from uh, Sisyphus on Amagama, check out all the other songs on the album that Rick Wright's written. And they've got that, that Sid quality. When he left, it did change things quite a lot. Although he came back for tours and he came back as a, as a, not as a, a member, but as like a sort of more of a session -y thing, he still made a lot of difference. It was. It was a crack in the wall when he left, not a brick. Yeah, it was sad, it was sad. But, you know, here's a man who's made so much money. Uh, he's in a band that are constantly at each other's throats. I mean, I know what I'd do in that situation. Yeah, see you boys, I'm going off to yacht around the world. <laughs> and be happy. After the service, when you're walking slowly to the car, I, just like everybody else, when I was 12, about 12, I played the guitar, was in a band with the local friends, and uh, we, we kind of found that we liked less playing live than, than the kind of playing and rehearsing. And so it was kind of maybe right from the very beginning, we were more into that. I grew up with a, a guy called Phil Thornelli, who, who was also, uh, we grew up in the same village together. He went on, he was in The Cure, he produced, Lots of stuff. He's hugely successful. Wrote Torn for Natalie and Brilliant. So we kind of had a, our careers kind of have gone along simultaneously. He got a job at a studio called Rack, which is in North London. And he was there for two or three years. And then because he was there, I went and visited him one weekend. And he said, oh, could you help me? And I kind of got in as a tape operator, sweeping the floor, making tea, just as normal. And then from started from there. And then... Uh, got a job full time and then was you just work your way up when you're at the tape op. You start off very slowly and then you get to be more involved and then you start engineering if you're if you're good enough two or three years later. So that's how I that's how I did it. I was a sort of senior uh, senior assistant at Rack at the time. I'd been there for a year or so. Uh, then what happens is bands get marked in and I got put on Pink Floyd because I think probably I was a senior. Um, and it's very exciting. You look at the sheet, you're going, wow, Pink Floyd are in. So these are legends from the age I was. I was 13 years old when Dark Side of the Moon was out. And when you're that age, if you, if you went to a concert anywhere, if you did anything that was involved with music, every single car stereo would be playing Dark Side of the Moon. It was just the album. So hugely, hugely influential on any of one of that age that was into music. That wasn't into the sweet or the pop stuff. technical point of view they if you think about Pink Floyd they were obviously one of the biggest groups in the world they could afford anything so one of the things that was quite interesting was when I first uh, James Guthrie who was the producer put the tapes up initially I was surprised at how dull it sounded in a way and I sort of made the comment and he said oh don't worry what we do is we record for example we record the drums onto 60 track 2 inch we record them and then don't touch them again. We do. We make a stereo track down to 
to, and we make a slave, and we work on the slave. So when we go to mix it, it's the drums having never been played before. So the, when you hear a Pink Floyd record, that's why it's so crisp. This is in the old days. This is why, and it's like just great sounding. Um, but when you're in a normal band, you record the drums on your 24 track, your two inch, and you just go over and over and over. By the end of it, you probably don't even notice how dull it is compared to how it was. But because Pink Floyd could afford to do slaves, they could just make two inch after two inch after two inch. So that's one of the reasons why. And it's a brilliantly produced album, really great sounding. But they were all very pleasant. It was again from a from a I was I think twenty years old at the time and Roger was always very pleasant and he would say uh David Gilmore would come and he said, oh, This is David Gilmore and it's like I'm thinking, I know who this is, you know, you don't have to say it, but it's still a very nice way to it, you know, this is Nick Mason. Mm. To someone like me, it's like of course I know who this, but it's nice to be introduced, isn't it? It's very kind of very civilized. Very English. Yeah, very English, yeah, but but very nice though. <laughs> The final cut certainly failed to live up to the artistic success of its illustrious predecessor. For many, there was a distinct sense of deja vu. I think, again, if there's a criticism of the final cut, to my mind, I, I love lyrics, great lyrics, and he's a brilliant lyricist, but also I love great tunes. And I'm not sure, sure the, the tunes on the final cut are as good as some of the tunes on Dark Side of the Moon or Wish You Were Here. I mean, those are fantastic tunes with fantastic lyrics. So if there's a criticism of it, maybe the tunes, maybe the songs aren't quite as good. But that's a small criticism because I think it's still great. The Wall wouldn't be my favorite album. So when you get the likes of The Final Cut coming out, you know, you've got really very much a Roger Waters orientated album and it's very very angry it's very shouty you don't get that beautiful Rick Wright and Dave Gilmore thing coming through there's no humor there at all it's very much waters repressed communist um, socialist sort of feelings coming through and his distaste for society which you know is on one level is good but on another level it's it's very serious a lot of people who love the war clearly hated um, the final cut I mean listen to the final cut now and again it's an interesting piece but it's it, it, it sort of follows on from the wall but it doesn't work like the wall did but then I don't think anything ever was going to work like the wall did. Well, an odd thing about this album another strange thing was that Roger he had it in his mind he, he told me this sort of one morning he said we're recording it in sequence which for an album was just bizarre. It's like usually you record 10 songs in those days in any old order. Maybe you might do start a song and three months later work on it again. He came in one morning and he played the first track that was on the album. It was already mixed and everything. It was like, this is, it's again, Pink Floyd, they can do that. It's a, it, to me, that was a huge concept to do it, do it in order. So to him, to him, it was a concept, and he he, he recorded it as a concept, which was uh, which is which is uh, interesting from from sort of any point of view. I think is re regarding reco recording. I'd never I'd never seen it before or since. No one had done that. So for me and for many other fans of the band, I think the final cut probably came as a as a huge disappointment. Um, to a large extent, it, it repeated the same emotional landscape that the wall did. Although the subject matter wasn't identical, it had all the same uh, landmarks there. The final cut dwells on the politics and social landscape of Britain in the early 1980s. The focus is incredibly narrow and could almost be lifted from an editorial meeting of The Guardian, Roger's newspaper of choice. The post-war dream was the dream that that was the war to end all wars and that we were going to learn a whole load of stuff from it. And we had the first Labour government in England immediately, well, 1947, I think. A National Health Service was introduced and uh, there was a feeling that um, 
we were going to build a kinder world out of the rubble, if you like. And I don't think we have. Take all your overgrown infants away somewhere and build them a home. A little place of their own A French or memorial Home for incurable tyrants And kings The final cut fails to rise to the same heady heights as its legendary predecessor. The listener inevitably getting the distinct impression of recycling the same thematic and musical landscape of the wall. In a few cases, this was literally true. As Dave Gilmore later confirmed, some of the pieces which found their way onto the final cut had already been rejected for the wall. It was torture to me. We really weren't getting on at all well. I felt that Roger was resurrecting tracks that we had not accepted for the Wall album. And I did say to him, they weren't good enough then, why are they good enough now? It got so difficult that uh, Roger wanted me to not have a say in what was going on on the production side of the album. So after a lot of arguing and umming and ahhing and soul searching, I agreed to come off the production credits. I think it had got to a point during the final cut where it can be safely said the two of them weren't really communicating. Gilmore wanted to do another, take another month to actually write some of his own material, but Waters had such a, a bee in his bonnet to get this material released quickly, recorded and released, that he went ahead. And effectively, working with, with Michael Kamen, it was a, a solo album where Mason and Gilmore came in effectively to do their bit. That said, Gilmore's contributions on it, where, where he does sort of break free on a few solos, you still know Dave Gilmore's very much there. And when you hear his voice finally come in on Not Now John, it's, it's like this beautiful relief that, oh, he, he, you know, he is here after sort of 40 minutes of, of Waters, you know, at his peak. And I love, and I actually love that record. I think it's a very interesting album, but shouldn't really be in the Pink Floyd canon. My recollection is that he was there a lot of the time, and he would, uh, he played quite a few solos in this, in the little period that I worked for them. He, uh, he wasn't hands-on. I always, I always got the feeling that David Gilmour was as much a producer as any of them, but he wasn't on this record. Um, a guy called Michael Kamen was, was co-producing it, I believe, and he was a sort of larger-than-life. He kind of reminded me of Francis Ford Coppola, if you imagine, in the music business. And because he was kind of this brash American, I think that was good with Roger. I think he could say things that might irritate if it had come from someone else, it may have irritated him, but again, that's just my memory that uh, he was able to be a little bit brash, a little bit poked fun of. But uh, so David Gilmore's involvement was my memories, just he sort of played a few solos. A couple of nights I seem to remember Roger went home early and then it kind of got a bit more fun, if you will. And I don't mean that bad towards Roger Waters, but it was sort of the, it became a bit more relaxed, I think. This album, which um, 
deals very much with um, Roger Waters' feelings about war, his father, everything else. Uh, a very dark album, uh, a disappointment to a lot of the Floyd fans at the time. And I think it was obvious then that something was going to give. Um, and this was really about the time of the end, if you like, of that classic era of Pink Floyd. The final cut did find itself built around three or four spare bricks from the wall. That is true. But the Falklands War, which had come about between the wall and the final cut, very much flavoured the other material that Roger Waters added to his bricks, to such an extent that Dave Gilmore decided he didn't want to have a credit as co-producer, although I believe he did take the royalty. Creatively, the final cut lacks the brilliant spark which made the wall such a spectacular success. For the first time since 1967, Pink Floyd were releasing an album without the input of Richard Wright. It was also launched without the involvement of either Hypnosis or Gerald Scarf to fall back on. Even the sleeve lacks the cutting edge of previous outings. I think you can see and hear the fragmentation of musicianship individual personalities within the band because it really was a Roger Waters solo album. I think most people who know Floyd would probably say and agree with that. For me, Final Cut is, um, is, is too far removed from the original sound of Pink Floyd because we lose um, Rick Wright. Um, he brought something um, special, I think, to the band. <laughs> Despite the reservations of its critics, inside and outside of the band, the final cut still made it to number one in the UK. Overseas audiences were somewhat mystified by the parochial subject matter and the intensely bitter tone of the lyrics, but the album has far greater structural faults in musical terms. With David Gilmour relegated to the role of hired hand in a Roger Waters-obsessed universe, there were none of the flashes of instrumental genius which had made the wall a complete package. I think we'd all absolutely had enough of working with each other. The wall had been an enormous sort of effort and not only had gone on for a long time with films, movies, Book of the Film, Son of Wall and all the rest of it. By the time we got the final cut, that was another development of the wall. I mean, that was meant to be the final, final, final wall. And I think also that by then Roger was doing so much of the writing, so much of the work, that he was feeling that we weren't pulling our weight and we were feeling frustrated that there was nothing to do. So I, I think it's a good example of the fault is fairly equally divided. The atmosphere of the album is relentlessly downbeat and with no melodic or instrumental relief, the darkness and bitterness are overwhelming. There are also very strong suggestions of leftover themes from the war. In the accompanying promo film, the role of the schoolteacher from the war is reprised and now depicted in his retirement. There is a strong feeling that we are revisiting exactly the same thematic landscape as the wall, with its exploration of the damaging effect of the sacrifices made in war. We are very much stuck in the same territory as the wall. Even the photograph on the album sleeve with the soldier holding film cans who has been cleanly knifed in the back has been widely interpreted as a reference to Roger's frustrations over the creation of the wall movie. Not now, John is the only place on the album where the tempo lifts. The song deals with the indifferent attitudes of those who were too oblivious to care about the subjects which troubled Waters so deeply. But it could almost have served as an anthem for all the Floyd fans, bored and disillusioned by the relentless diet of earnestness and yearning for an injection of instrumental genius to lighten the mood.
I think, again, criticisms, I've read criticisms of the dynamics of it are huge. It's like you got to turn up the quiet bits and then the loud bits are so loud you got to turn it down. But again, if you think about it, when the album was made, it was, it was on vinyl and everything had to be squashed. You couldn't go frequency wise, you couldn't go as low or as high. There was a lot of hiss. You could only get certain volume onto the vinyl. And then when CDs came out, you could just put, put so much more. So I think this album really, I think they remastered the version I heard, and it's, it's really impressive. With only Waters producing new material in volume. Surprisingly, however, it was Waters who chose to pursue the solo path, taking his pros and cons of hitchhiking tour onto the road. Inevitably, in a band like Pink Floyd, there's a lot of jealousy builds up and rancor and backbiting. And, and as I'm, I'm on record often, so I think bands tend to stay together far too long because it's safe and comfortable and you have a guaranteed sale of concert tickets and records and things like that because the brand name is very powerful. But I stayed far too long. Hey, you, don't help them to bury the love. As a result of a dispute with manager Steve O'Rourke, Roger Waters wrote to the record companies, informing them that he would no longer be recording with Pink Floyd. Waters clearly felt that this maneuver would signal the end of the group. Hey you, out there on your own, sitting naked by the phone, would you touch me? Stop. 